Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Woodward, one of the second year fellows. Uh, it's good to see everyone. I see a couple of familiar faces here. I might be missing a few. So I'm going to be providing a medication update. I don't have any disclosures. These are some goals and objectives to talk about today. And since I'm first up, I just wanted to kind of get us all on the same page as far as Parkinson disease. I always like talking a little bit about history as well. So when it comes to the history of Parkinson disease, it's named after Dr. James Parkinson, who published an essay on the shaking palsy with a few of his patients in his clinic, as well as people he saw on the street with similar symptoms. And he initially thought this was actually related to the spinal cord, although we now know this is related to the brain. And then about 60 years later, another famous neurologist, uh, Dr. Jean-Marie Charcot, named it after James Parkinson's in honor of him. So as far as Parkinson's disease itself, this is due to a loss of brain cells that produce the neurotransmitter dopamine. About 50% loss of these cells are where motor symptoms tend to start for Parkinson's disease. And that's the things we talk about, like tremor, slowness, and stiffness. And there are basically buildups and abnormal clumps of protein inside and out, outside the cells, which are leading to this dysfunction and death of these cells. These are some examples of what we see sometimes uh, with something like a dissection, or we look at the brainstem, and you can see that area that's producing dopamine becomes more pale as it's losing those cells that are then sending the dopamine throughout the, throughout the brain. And to the right there are the pictures of what it can look like in the cells. Those are called Louis. Used since the 1960s, and we have a very good idea of how to use this medication, what it does, what it does not do. And so that's why many of you in this room may be on this medication and why we still use it so much today. And a lot of our newer medications are different formulations or takes or ways to release this medication in a steadier fashion. Side effects often can be things like GI upset, although a lot of people will get used to that. Uh, their body gets used to it. Dizziness or lightheadedness after taking a dose as blood pressure can sometimes decrease. Uh, further in Parkinson's disease, it can be prone to causing hallucinations. And uh, when we talk about dyskinesia, we usually mention Michael J. Fox as an example, that kind of excessive wiggly sort of movement. And that's a consequence of both the duration of Parkinson's disease as well as the medication's interaction. It's not necessarily the med medication by itself causing that. So as far as why we use levodopa and why we recommend certain formulations versus other, this is a graph that basically shows you the amount that's in your blood or in your brain over time. And so these are a Cinemat immediate release or Carbidopa Levodopa immediate release, which is one of the main ones we use. And then there's a controlled release formulation there in red. And then Ritari, which is a combination of immediate and extended release and another medication called Saliva, which has um, another medication that I'll talk about a little bit later. What you can see is that the immediate release is good because it gives you that quick peak and then kind of wears off over time compared to something like the controlled release where there may not be as large of a peak. And so that's why sometimes we may use that at night where it has more of a steady amount give, uh, given to you overnight. And the immediate release we use more during the day. And this is why we often will dose it up to three times a day or more based on that kind of peak quickly and then wearing off maybe about 50% or more is kind of out of the system by two or three hours. As far as just some misconceptions with levodopa that have been out there and still are uh, out there today, uh, there was initially a thought that levodo levodopa could be toxic to the brain. We now know that's not true. Levodopa losing its effect efficacy over time. That's the Parkinson disease itself. And levodopa leading to earlier dys dyskinesia as opposed to if you didn't start it in the first place or waited to start it. And so we know this by comparing patients who had access to levodopa early and did not have access to levodopa early, and they developed dyskinesias at the same time once you started to pro provide them that medication if they didn't already have it. This is just a list of a lot of the different medications that are out there for Parkinson's disease. I won't be speaking about all of these, but there are some general kind of classes of medication like levodopa or dopamine replacement, dopamine agonists, malinhibitors, uh, et cetera. And some of these are, can work by themselves as a medication. And some of these work with our medications like carbidopa, levodopa in order to provide benefit. So there are some other forms of levodopa besides Cinemet that we talk about. And so I'm going to just talk about some of the newer ones on the market. There are now quarter scored carbidopa levodopa with the brand name Divi. 
And this is easier to break. So you could take a quarter to a half, three quarters of the pill uh, if you have a little bit more of a sensitivity to the medication. There is also now inhaled levodopa uh, by the brand name of Imbresia. And basically this is levodopa in an inhaled powder form. And this we consider a rescue medication. So this isn't something that you're taking on a regular basis. This is for as needed for things like sudden off times, doses that don't seem to work as well as they should of your regular medication. So it's not replacing the other medications, it's used uh, in addition. Side effects would be similar to levodopa, as I mentioned. And additionally, because it is a respiratory medication, it can lead to things like cough, upper respiratory infections, or a change in, in color of sputum or saliva. There is also a intestinal gel version of carbidopa levodopa called duopa. This is basically through a stomach tube that goes directly into the stomach and gives a constant amount of levodopa in order to try to smooth things out to prevent those dyskinesias from high doses and those off times. And this has been uh, since around since 2015. And compared to oral tablets, uh, patients often get two or more hours of on time without bothersome dyskinesia with this. Newer, that is hopefully coming out pretty soon uh, from a couple different companies, is a subcutaneous dopamine therapy. If you think of something like an insulin pump for patients with diabetes, and this is delivering the medication through the skin. And there are the clinical trials for one of the first ones has been completed. We were actually one of the clinical sites and we have a couple of patients um, that we see regularly who are still using the pump and we're waiting for final FDA approval for it. They just needed some more information in terms of the device itself. Um, we're hoping that comes soon. And as far as unique sort of side effects for this one, because it is going through the skin, there is risk of things like redness, irritation, or skin infections with this one. Again, similar to the Duopa or the intestinal gel, this is trying to smooth things out by uh, providing a constant amount of levodopa. There are also a brand or a general uh, class of medications called dopamine agonists, which are helping to change the way your brain releases what dopamine is already there as opposed to replacing dopamine. The advantages of this medication or these medications are there are various formulations, immediate releases, extended releases. There does seem to be less likely a uh, amount of fluctuation related to them and less interference with protein, which is a constant battle with taking the Cinemat for some potentially. And as far as side effects go, they do have some unique side effects, which has come out a little bit more and more as we've used these medications over the years and have us sometimes shy away from it uh, if we don't think it's necessarily a good fit. And those can be things like swelling in the legs, uh, excessive sleepiness or sleepy sleep attacks, uh, higher chance of lowering blood pressure, um, and something called impulse control disorder, excessive shopping, excessive gambling, internet use, et cetera. And oftentimes when you take away this medication, those, med uh, those side effects will go away. There is also a class of medications called NMDA receptor antagonists. The most common one out there is amantadine. And this, for some, may be a first or second line agent, especially in the community, to try and treat Parkinson's disease. More often now, especially in, in our practice, we will often use this more for dyskinesias. Uh, it's one of the medications we have to try and help reduce dyskinesia. It's usually taken two, two to three times daily or once daily in, in certain formulations and is available as a liquid. And we do use it cautiously if you have a kidney injury. And there are some other side effects to this one compared to others, such as uh, trouble with sleeping. So we usually dose it closer to the morning time, confusion, dry mouth, uh, it can lead to falls and this rash you can see on the side, which is not necessarily bothersome or itchy or anything like that, but cosmetically can um, cause some concern. There is a newer brand of amantadine called amantadine extended release or gocovri, which is to be taken once, this time at bedtime, sometimes still in the morning. And uh, this is actually the only one that's approved for dyskinesia, although we still use amantadine immediate release off-label with good success as well. And so it has similar side effects to regular amantadine. There's another class of medications called COMT inhibitors. So these are medications that you may have heard of like entacapone, tolcapone, or a newer one, apicapone, which I have another slide on. This basically stops the breakdown of dopamine and it allows the levodopa, the dopamine to stick around a little bit longer. 
So this uh, adds more on time per dose and it's taken with levodopa. By itself, it really won't have any sort of effect. And there can be a little bit more in terms of GI upset, uh, change in color of things like urine or sweat as, uh, as far as those go. So a newer version of a COMT inhibitor is a picapone. The brand name is Ongentis. This one is once a day compared to something like the tolcapone or intacapone, which you actually take with every dose of the carbidopa levodopa, more or less. This one is just once a day. Still just brand name at this point. There are generally an older class of medications that we use as well called MAL inhibitors. And these are things like resagiline, brand name Azelect or Selegiline, or a new medication called Safinamide. This prevents the breakdown of the body's natural recycling of neurotransmitters like dopamine. So again, it's keeping what dopamine is in your brain around longer. And in general, it has a mild to modest effect for most. And it can be taken alone or with levodopa. So some of you may be on both of these. And depending on which one, usually you're taking once to twice a day. And it, one kind of unique side effect to this is it could increase blood pressure a little bit because it is working on other neurotransmitters as well. In some cases, maybe with low, low blood pressure, this might be beneficial. Uh, a newer class of medications, um, this one is called istradefiline or brand name Nurians. This is usually used on top of other Parkinson medications and not on its own. And it's approved for off time or off episodes. And therefore, by trying to provide a little bit more on time, it could lead to dyskinesias, very much like most of the medications that we use. Uh, the precise reason why it works is not quite clear, but it does seem to have a similar effect or similar pathways to caffeine. We call it a, a denosine receptor um, medication. And I think just to mention uh, before I finish is and some of us will pr probably, most of us will talk about this. Still, the one thing we know that's best for Parkinson's disease and can slow progression down is exercise. The most important thing is what you will do on a regular basis. So if you don't like running and you're not going to do it, it doesn't matter. You need to find something that you like to do. And luckily, there's resources all around in the area as far as boxing classes, yoga classes, getting on a bike, swimming, whatever you like to do. That's what's important. And with that, uh, I think I'm done.